Hello. Hey, Jeannie. Um, welcome to another <laughs> Bad Batch, minus everyone except me at the moment, um, stream to discuss the music and sound in the Bad Batch episode 312, which is season three, episode 12. As you can see today, Justin is Justin and James and Christina are not here, so it's just me. Christina might join later, but Justin's in New York, uh, and no, James is in New York. He has a premiere of, of a new piece, so shout out to James. I hope his premiere goes well. And Justin is doing some event at school, but he did send examples, and they're very, very good, so I'm excited to play them for you. Today will probably be a shorter stream. The episode didn't have as much, it definitely didn't have, you know, as much music as last week, um, which was a pretty heavy set of episodes. But yeah, today it's just, uh, it's just me. It's just me and chat. And this is a good time to ask like, I don't know, any questions or any, any bit of, um, any areas you want me to take a listen to and uh, speak to like that I don't already have in my notes to cover. Um, yeah, feel free to throw out timestamps at any point and I will be able to actually efficiently get to them. Sometimes these things get lost in the chat and it goes pretty fast, but, um, today will be, you know, a little bit <laughs> more time to focus on it. Um, so this would normally be the time where I ask everyone like what their overall reactions to this episode were, were, are, um, like in terms of the music, but also the story and how the themes are maybe coming back. Um, and hey, Mask Jedi. <laughs> hey, Matthew. Um, I feel like, like this episode had a lot of themes or it had things that came back just from the last set of episodes, but there were also a couple things that harkened back to um, like the original trilogy, I think. Good evening, afternoon. It is 12 here. What time is it for everyone in whatever time zone you're at? It is new. It is 12, 12 here today. Um, yeah, like there's one spot where there, there, there's a chord progression that is very reminiscent of the Rebel fanfare. Um, and I wonder if that stuck out to anyone else. But yes, we do have some new music, we do have some old music, and we did have a pretty scary ending. Like, I think this was a very scary ending to the episode. Um, I don't know what y'all thought. Like, 9.13 p.m. Huh. Whereabouts are you again, Jeannie? Because that's not a U.S. time. Right? Yeah, no. The latest in the U.S. would be 3.13, 8.13 in the U.K. P.M.? Right, P.M., okay. Okay, cool. Yeah, that checks out. It's 3.13 where you are, You're right, on the East Coast. Yeah, and Matthew, um, I'm jealous of your eclipse experience. That sounded really, really cool. Um, Frankfurt, Germany. That's really cool. I actually, I have a cousin that lives there. <laughs> 2013, 8.13, okay, took me a while. Wow, so a lot of people are not in the US. That's interesting. Well, cool, hello. Um, I'm gonna actually start out since right at the beginning, there is a kind of a new thing that happened in the episode and it is one of the examples that Justin sent me to play for you all. The opening like snare thing, it got cut off early and we got this like very ominous like wom synth moment, um, which kind of like played with, I don't know, it played with my expectations a little bit because I'm used to just hearing the synth intro and then the music starts, but it was like, very, and you're in Toronto, that's hilarious, wow. Is anyone, <laughs> anyone in the US? Um, yeah, so I'm going to play what Justin made for that. It's very good. Oops, I have my system audio muted. Okay. Okay, 
Here we go. Yeah, it wasn't the normal thing. Nope, you can't hear that either. Sorry, just a second. I need to, there we go. Okay, take three. Northumberland, is that's not how you say that, is it? North of the wall, just before Scotland. I feel like I'm saying, I'm definitely saying that wrong, probably. What impact do you think, or what impact did the opening have on you to have it so immediately jump into, I don't know, the action, the, the ominous, I wrote dark ominous music starts immediately. I feel like it kind of set me up for maybe a more intense episode than what I think we got. I mean, it was an intense episode and it ended really, it ended on a, like it ended well, I think. Um, but it was a very, for, for me at least, like point A to point B episode, which makes sense. Like I th think after the last episode especially there was I mean there kind of was a necessary transition perhaps whether they needed to show that or not I don't know but but they did and so um it kind of threw us right into the action and I mean I, I guess I appreciate them not wasting time I guess setting the setting the tone for the show and I like it in general when this show plays with the opening and the end credits um of course, like striking a balance is good because if it's always different, then it won't stick out as much. But I feel like, yeah, they've they've kept a pretty solid intro for most of the episodes. So this was earned or whatnot. Um, let's see. Yeah. And like, I feel like every time I see Mount Tantus, it, it's just scarier. Like it just gets worse in my mind. Um, the different opening caught me off guard. I wonder if this will be the new opening music or if they will continue to change it each episode as the series wraps up. Huh. I, I don't know. I feel like if this is, I feel like if they're going to start changing it up, this would be a good episode to start because there's only like several left. I kind of hope they change it up. I heard this episode, um, this YouTube interview of the Kiners um, last week, and something they mentioned in it was, let's see, what did they mention in it? Let's see. I took a note of it. Let's see. Where did I take this note? Oh, I took it in my regular notes. Okay. They said something, there's three episodes left, so they said something about the music in the last episode, Sean and Deanna said that the end credits track for the last episode is their favorite, is like their favorite thing. And the whole finale, the last half of the last episode, basically. Um, I don't think they gave any other hints about like the opening, but I think that would be cool. Tantus, so Tantus, so, also, opening with Tantus at night, I feel like, adds another, I don't know, it makes it even more ominous to me. I'm kind of, I'm watching it in the background right now with the sound off, so. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay, the Master Jedi. I'm struggling to remember this story for this episode, let alone the music, I'm afraid. Um, yeah, so basically in this episode, well, honestly, the main, the main thing, basically everyone, Omega is being taken to Tantus because she let herself go there. I mean, she let them take her and the Bad Batch need to follow her um, so that they can help, you know, save everyone. 
but the Bad Batch don't know how to get there. So then they find out how to get like, so then there's the whole like side mission of they need to find Hemlock who is imprisoned in, in, in an Imperial facility um, because Rampart knows how to get there. Um, but for me, the biggest part was just that Omega got thrown in with the four sensitive children. Also, um, I don't know what, em- I still don't know. I still don't know what to make of Emery. I feel like, I feel like she's prime for some surprising action that's going to come in the next, maybe in the finale or something. Um, because she did test her blood and, and has, is giving nothing away, which maybe is part of selling whatever she's doing. Like, if she is indeed trying to make a move because she has the power to make, like, one good move, perhaps she needs to act like she's completely on the Empire side. That's what I'm hoping, at least. Um, yeah, Rampart. And we did get Rampart's theme. So Matthew says, yeah, quickly looked at the episode beginning again, and it feels like the opening was cut off and jumped into the music for Mount Tantus rather than a new theme to start the show. Yeah. And like the more I think about it, the more I appreciate the, um, what's it called? Like the economy of opening. Like I appreciate just jumping into it. I would have liked more of Omega and Mount Tantus. Same, same, same. I would have liked more of Omega and Mount Tantus. Like I think those are the, those are the more interesting parts. Um, the sort of action stuff with a lot of fighting with the the rest of the bat. I keep saying bad batch with the rest of the bad batch is not that interest is not as interesting to me. I think one of the reasons I gravitate more toward the Tantus episodes and just seeing Omega in Mount Tantus is because of the slower pace, because everything feels really deliberate, which creates like this, really uncomfortable tension and um, like unease, especially as we see Hemlock kind of saying things, saying terrible things, but like with a smile, with a smirk on his face. We have lots of slow dialogue. We have lots of music in Mount Tantus that has a very unique um, like signature. Like it has a very, there's a very unique sound world in Mount Tantus, both, I mean, the sound design and the music. And I think, I mean, I guess we can't separate, I can't separate the music from, from the location and the characters, but I think maybe the musical world also, um, draws me more into Mount Tantus. Um, Jeannie says, Emery's sighs this episode were not subtle. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That's also true. Um, Emery is the most fascinating character this season. Why was she created? I hope we find out. I didn't catch it up, but I've seen others online mentioning how Emery's glasses change colors that give away what she is thinking or feeling. Interesting. I haven't noticed that, but I have noticed that her glasses change colors. Hmm. I would have to look back and review that. But also, we wouldn't know to verify, like, there's no way we can verify it because unless we definitely know what she's feeling and thinking. So it's kind of like, I think that could be, that's an easy one to like self-validate and yeah, if it makes sense to you, then I guess that's fine. I would guess that it's more related to the task that she's working on. And then like, you know how like transition lenses will turn color in the UV or whatever, turn dark in the UV. Like, cause I bet as her, in her role at Mount Tantus, she's having to, I don't know, go into all kinds of places with, I, I don't know, like different beams and different chemicals and stuff. So I would guess that maybe they're protecting her from the various substances, substances, sort of like, I don't know, 
lab glasses or something. I don't know. Um, okay, let me go back to my notes. Okay, so we start out with that opening, Justin wrote opening, boo. And by the way, um, he made that with a layered micro freak. That's the synth that he used. Um, and then on Tantus bass, Hemlock is like, begin testing her at once. I want confirmation. Again, I think it's strange that Hemlock trusts Emery to just test her, and then he walks away. I do think that's a little bit strange. Like, I feel like, he, I don't know. Then again, Emery hasn't given him a reason to be suspicious yet. But I just feel like this is so critical that he would just watch her and just make sure she does it correctly. I don't know. Um, we get a little bit of like light Emery music there. And, and I mean the, the triplet stuff, the, let's see, where is it? This type of thing. But just a little bit. Um, and then we get to back to where, uh, back to Pabu, that's right. Crosshair says that there's someone he knows who might have the coordinates and it's Rampart. Um, I think it's like, oh, right, then Fee appears. Right, okay, it's, it's coming back to me. Okay, he says that he might know someone who has the coordinates and the Bad Batch are like, why didn't you tell us sooner? And he's like, I really don't want to go back to Tantus. Um, which, you know, f fair, fair, um, but still. I think Hemlock was testing Emery to follow through with the testing as there had, had to be a huge number of cameras in that room. Yeah, that's possible. Have they shown that there are cameras? There probably are. Anyway, if you have the episode handy, go to 442 because that's when Fee arrives and the music is, let me find an exact time to tap. She comes up the riser. Okay, it's like at 440. Like AZ, or 440, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that what it was? Kind of sounded like the uh, the Rebel fanfare. Yeah, there we go. At four forty, it was like D major to F major. It's just like a very heroic sounding, like, um, is a very heroic sounding, I don't know, like very brief fanfare. Like it wasn't given very much attention, but it was just a very subtle way to, um, like to bring her back on screen, I guess. Um, okay. Ender says, <laughs> wait, I'm filling out my notes because I didn't write that in my notes. D major to F major. <laughs> Okay. Um, no, they have not. And Nala say cheated the testing constantly in that room. They may have installed cameras, but they have given us no indication that th that particular room is being monitored closely. Yeah, that's what, that's, so because they haven't shown it yet, unless they have, and I've missed it, I feel like it, they wouldn't then bring that up later. And if they did, it would be like cheating. But um, yeah. There's no Chekhov's camera. Um, there's been no Chekhov's camera. But there have been like Chekhov's other things. Okay, so then. Oh, right. Then they're driving. Okay. And then they're back to. Okay. <laughs> the name of the like thing that the. The name of the, I don't know what, they're, what it's called, the truck, the tank, is called an HCVW A9 turbo tank, which 
I did not notice this. Ender pointed it out. It is a juggernaut, and that's that's perhaps why it's called Juggernaut. The episode. Um, but of course, the the dual meaning, like the tank that they're driving, is the tank that's moving along is a juggernaut, but also a juggernaut is a huge, powerful, and overwhelming force or institution. So that's kind of a, a neat, I don't know, double entendre, turbo tank. Oh no, Jeannie, turbo tank just reminded me of turbo tax. And I wish I didn't think of that. <laughs> okay, so then they're back in... Okay, right. Then we hear the band, the, the Bad Batch theme and Fee's like, I called in a favor um, with one of my contacts. It cost me a hefty sum, but I've got an overview of the labor camp on Erebus. And Fee shows them her trick, which was falling. It was her stealth approach. And then they are on Erebus. The turbo tank was also used in a Mando episode. Right. right mm-hmm. Perhaps there were some music cues as well. I don't know. I didn't review that Mando episode prior to this. But my guess is that... I, okay, I guess so far in the shows, I haven't seen very much cross-pollination across the shows if the composers were different. Um, it would be cool if that happened, but I haven't noticed it yet, I think. Have I noticed it? No, I don't think I have. The fee fall. That's good. <laughs> um, okay, so then we get to, we're doing more action stuff with the Bad Batch. And for me, this is like the slowest part of the episode. Um, the stuff with the Juggernaut. And an overall, like just observation of this episode is there's a lot of action ostinato. Just a ton of it. Just various very basic sort of tension slash action music. Um, like, do, 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 do. I don't know. I'm, I'm doing a, probably a bad representation of it, but like when it comes, like, okay, don't take this too seriously, but if and when, if and when, composers for shows like this. I hope it doesn't happen. I hope Star Wars never does this. If they start using like AI compo like AI composition tools, like generative AI composition tools to score some of their episodes, and I hope they don't. Um, writing this kind of action music will be the e will be like the easiest thing, I think, for AI to spit out. Which okay. Um Yeah, that probably sounded like a huge dig, but like it's just it's, it comes part and parcel with most, I guess, most television, sh television shows and movies that ha deal with, um, that are kind of action oriented and sort of more mainstream and stuff. It's very, it's just part of the, I don't know, the lexicon of the, of the genre. Um, and so this episode had a lot of that. And when there's a lot of that in an episode, it is harder for me to pay attention um, cause it's kind of just like, you can start it and you can just like keep it going for a while. Yeah, I don't know. And it's, you know, repetitive. It's probably not as fun to write as the other stuff either. While they were in the tank, it sounded like if John Williams scored an episode of the A-Team. Oh, that's, wait, what's the A-Team? <laughs> it sounds familiar. I'm looking it up. Star cars? Star, is that, is that what it is? Like, <laughs> does anyone know what the A-team is? A-team show. Oh, never mind. Okay. Okay, okay. I know what the A-team is now. I mean, at least I'm looking at the Wikipedia page. It's an American action adventure series that ran 
on NBC from January 83 to March 1987 about former members of a fictitious U.S. Army Special Forces unit. The four members of the team were tried by court-martial for a crime they had not committed. They were convicted and sentenced to serve terms in, in a military prison, but later escaped to Los Angeles and began working as soldiers of fortune while trying to clear their names and avoid cap. This is funny. I can see that. But I haven't heard the music of the show, but still. Um, with Mr. T... Mr. T, A team. Okay, I've heard of him. No, I've seen him in like memes, I think. That's funny. Mercenaries. With the Bad Batch, when the Bad Batch was first announced, a lot of people were calling it the Star Wars version of the A team. Yep, the Bad Batch is basically Star Wars A team. Ah. That's good to know. I mean, I feel like even though I don't know the A-team, I feel like the concept of the A-team is also not limited to just the A-team. Like, I, I feel like, um, like, aren't the Power Rangers kind of like that, too? Um, or like, no, I guess not Ocean's Eleven, but yeah. Without Omega, right? Omega kind of changes things, huh? Okay, so... Oh, yeah, okay. I think this part is funny. Oh, wait, Wrecker is B.A., Mr. T. Hunter is Hannibal. Hannibal. Who's Face and Murdoch? <laughs> I'll leave that up there for anyone to answer. Okay, so... There's a Mickey Mouse moment, which is where the music really closely mimics the action, where Wrecker punches the trooper, and then the music cuts off abruptly. Um, that did get my attention. And then Crosshair's like, Wrecker, remember Plan 55? And I just think it's really funny how they keep name dropping random plan numbers. like, And they're all multiples of 11, which is a nice touch. Aren't they, are they? Yeah. 55, 66, 99. Um, I'm just waiting for them to say like plan 11, plan 22, plan 121. No, they probably won't do that. They're multiples of 11 and they're palindromes. But I just feel like every episode there's going to be like Crosshair bringing up a new plan number. Like, oh, it's that plan. It's, you know, it's 33. Uh, oh, 72. There is a 72? Bad Batch, Plan 72. Oh, you're right. No, you're right. There is a Plan 72. Okay, well then they'll just keep saying... <laughs> they'll keep saying plan numbers, though. I'll stick with that. Um, and then... We have this part that I will play because I transcribed it. And let's see, where's my note? Okay, yeah, when they get to um, Rampart, and Rampart recognizes um, recognizes Crosshair, it's a, you know, it, it's not a sweet reunion, but it is a reunion. We have this cello thing. Just imagine this, like, a couple octaves lower. It's like, sorry. times. It's catchy. Um, I'm a fan. I put a, I'll put up a transcription. Um, and I think Crosshair, like Rampart calls Crosshair by his trooper number, CT, whatever. And um, Crosshair's like, you remember. Now, I don't think I read this as super genuine, I don't, but um, yeah. It's a funny, tense reunion. And then, yeah, I agree. Okay, well, Jeannie says, yes, it made the exchange between Crosshair and Rampart almost comical. Yeah, it was comical. Um, 
And it was nice to see the Bad Batch working as a unit with Crosshair without fighting. Agreed. Agreed. And they were kind of, like, they were kind of mad that Crosshair let Omega go, but then I think they quickly realized that it was, unfortunately, like, what was kind of necessary. And I'm glad that their fighting is, like, mostly out of the way. Or, or it has, um, you know, it has progressed to a different kind of fighting, which is more like the kind of fighting that happens when you are close with someone, and it's more, it's more um, in good, it's more like jokey. Because I think there is a weird thing that happens, like when people are friends, but they don't know each other well enough to feel comfortable making fun of each other and then it kind of creates a vibe that is a little bit too stilted and cautious and I think it's it's nice when there's like respect but also the ability to make fun of each other um, some were saying that was Rampart's theme but I don't remember it well Rampart's theme was in that scene, but it wasn't that part that I just played. Because Rampart's theme is this. And we did get that in the episode. In a different key. We got it in D minor, so we got like. It's a good theme. It's fr it is from, um, I think the first time we hear, it, we definitely hear it in season one. Was it, season, was it episode three or episode 11? My notes are unclear. It says episode three in my notes, but then I don't know if that's a typo because I don't know if we met Rampart that soon. It just doesn't. I think I would. Rem I don't think we met Rampart that soon, so I think it was episode eleven. Um, when they said they were going after Rampart, I paused the show to look up what Rampart looked like. I remembered the name, but couldn't remember the face. Oh, I can't remember the face, so I'm looking it up right now. Actually, yeah, I. Yeah, I don't, I mean, <laughs> okay, I just watched the episode, so, like, I know what he looked like in the episode, but I didn't recognize him. Like, I, there's no way I would have recognized him. Oh, he didn't have a beard before. Oh. <laughs> okay, it's coming to me now. He's the one on the left. Okay. That's wild. Like, when an animated character grows a beard my ability, like, yeah, I don't know. It's hard for, it's hard for that to work for me, like it, for me to recognize them, um, which is fine because they just called out who he was, but yeah, he was one of those, he was also scary in a similar way that Hemlock is, which is like, they make him very like classically good looking and just horrible like it's really scary um okay so then we get some crosshair synthy stuff um ramparts like if you're not here to ex execute me and you're not letting me go then you must need something from me so crosshair tells him we need to know where tanta's base is and right on cue we get the clone facility theme or you know the tantus theme i don't know what to call it like Clone, clone facility, Tantus, Hemlock. Um. Sorry, I was doing a major version of it. Hmm. Yikes. Uh, that's not good. Okay. And then we get Rampart. I'll talk, 
I'll talk after you get me off this planet. You don't get what you want if I don't get what I want. Um, then they have the scary bridge moment. And um, then at 1638, I feel like this music sounded like it was from a Disneyland ride. And their crosshair percussion theme. What percussion theme do you mean? That sounded like Hemlock in Love. Oh no. That would be a plot twist. Um, oh, Max, since you're here, I will play you um, something that Justin, an example that Justin sent from the beginning of the episode, and it was made with layered micro freak. So this is the way the episode started after this after the snare thing. Oops, again, I have to turn off my system audio. first one um yeah um fee's ship looks a bit like the drop ship in aliens and the music around 1640 reminded me of james horner's score as well oh interesting 1640 is the part that i think thought sounded like disneyland music um I'm going to look up the dropship in Aliens. I th believe I have seen that movie. I just don't. Oh, you're right. It kind of does. Huh. Which kind of reminds me of the ornithopter in Dune. With the, you know, these things. Okay, I wonder what you mean by James Horner's score there, because what I'm hearing at 1638 is this like very bubbly sort. It's like it's after Wrecker jumps off the tank in time and he's safe. You're welcome, Max. It's like so. Imagine like string arpeggios. It's like so. It's like. very optimistic and it doesn't sound like Disney Disneyland in on the piano when I play it but it's like in the score it's it's the very twinkly you know what it sounds like okay it sounds like at the end of the ride when you're like descending you're coming back down from from the I don't know like the end of Calif what what's that Soren at the end of Soren or something it's like <laughs> you're making a soft landing or something um, yes, that Escaping the Planet music had a very 80s Escaping the Planet vibe in Aliens and Return of the Jedi. Mm. Also, I'll point out that, let me put the tran my transcription up there. Um, this track, or sorry, this cue greatly used the Lydian mode. And apologies if you're sick of hearing the Lydian mode explained, <laughs> but I'm going to explain it again. Um, oh, that twinkly part for the stars in space is like Horner's aliens. Ah, okay. Yeah. The twinkly stuff, it, it, twinkly is a good word for it. So, um, oh, I guess I did use that word too. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'll keep in the, so, okay. We're like in F, right?
So in, in F major, the sequence of notes is normally F, G, A, B flat. And then, so in the Lydian mode, you raise the fourth. So that's the B flat. You raise the B flat to be natural. And again, examples of Lydian mode in Star Wars include um, and lots of other stuff. It's just also um, Rose's theme from Return of the Jedi, sorry, from The Last Jedi. The Lydian mode is often invoked for, you know, like optimi optimistic. Um, almost like childlike wonderment moments, but just, it was very, I don't know, optimistic, very bright is what I would say to that. Horner's score for Aliens has been used in so many trailers. It's full of great action pieces. Has it really? I did not know that. I'm curious how they got rights for that now. <laughs> Hmm. I have gone on a podcast bef before. See, the fun, this is like, this is kind of embarrassing, but I'm pretty sure I have seen, I've definitely seen Alien. And I have seen Aliens, I think, because there's a podcast called Alien Minute, maybe? Um, you know, like Star Wars Minute. And I have been on that show, I think twice even, to talk about the music in a portion of Alien and maybe Aliens. So at some point, maybe five, maybe like eight years ago, I don't know, maybe five years ago, at some point I did watch it and pay attention to the score. I just do not remember because after I did the podcast, I just <laughs> forgot it all. But yeah, at some point, if you want to hear me talk about the music of Alien or Aliens, um, then you can look for that. Um, yeah, I wish I knew what episodes they were. But anyway, um, okay, thanks for explaining musical terms again and again. I don't have much of a musical background. Yeah, no problem. Um, I figure the review is always good for at least someone in the chat, probably probably most people. Um because I don't expect everyone to like be present for every time I um, have ever described a musical th thing in an episode. Um, okay. Back to Tantus. Oh no, we get um, the Bad Batch theme again at around 1650, but it's like more contemplative, contemplative. Um, Rampart says nobody knows the coordinates to Tantus. And then we're back to Tantus, and Emery's checking Omega's sample. Omega's looking at her like, I don't know. And Hemlock enter, enters. Um, and then he starts showing Omega the vault, the M count stuff. And here I have an excellent example from Just, Just, Justin. Um, and I will play that for you. It's a, the example that he made is one minute long, so he always goes above and beyond, I swear. Okay.
Thank you, Justin. Um, yeah, that sounded so good. That was made with layered deep mind. The synth, okay, the, le the synth sound from the beginning of the episode, was it from Mount Tantus or is it from Crosshair? I think, I think it's Mount Tantus. Um, so it's funny that he had, he had a whole minute of continuous music to make a sample from and um, the vault made with layered deep mind. We hear already um, a familiar theme from last episode and from earlier this episode, but this is the first time in this episode that it's really present. And I made this note in the last couple episodes, I can't remember exa exactly which one, um, where I mentioned that it's so kind of, that little, that motif or whatever is so kind of engrossing that it's hard for me to pay attention to anything else while it's going on. And again, I feel like when it shows up here, either it's just too easy for me to pay all my attention to it and slash or it was also pretty high up in the sound mix, I think. I don't know, but it also could just be my subjective like attention to it. And to be fair, sometimes it's I pay more attention to music than the actual dialogue or anything else. Um, so I thought it was distracting, but it sounds cool. Sounds cool and is distracting. Um, yes, awesome recreation. Thanks, Justin. It sounded really cool. And also I love synths. Yeah. Um, so we were talking last week about what we associate that particular theme with. And I was, I think some, some suggestions were that it's for Project Necromancy, Necromancer or it's for, I don't know, the one that I said it, that I thought it was for was Dr. Carr's uncertain, uncertainty. I no longer exactly think it's that because we did hear it in this episode absent of Emery. So yeah, the association that I made last stream is probably not as salient now that we've, now that we're hearing that theme without her on screen. Um, yeah, but that's okay. Hemlock's like, you are a vital piece to our work here, Omega. And then we see the room with the with the M count kids, with the force sensitive children. And um, we hear our familiar, let's see. Okay, last week we were kind of discussing what we think those notes are. And I feel more certain this week that it is these notes, though this is a half step lower than what we hear Sorry, I keep rotating this. Ah. Um, I'll put a, I'll, actually, let me put a side by side. Okay. Uh, M count, the child. Okay, this is what I said last week on the left. And this is what I think. And then on the right, it, it was a half step lower. And it all maps out um, to the same thing. So from E flat last week. Now it starts on D, and then last week it was B flat and A flat, and now it's, sorry, B flat and A flat, and now it's A natural and G. Um, and then last week the third note, I guess, was F sharp, or sorry, it was G, E, and this week it was F sharp, E flat, and then finally the last note was D, B, and this time it was C sharp, B flat. Um, let me play that. Yeah, 
Yeah, I feel more confident about it. <laughs> I think these are the right notes. And just trying to like analyze it a little bit, like um, I am noting, like last week I was noting the um, last week I was noting the intervals between the different ones. I guess I didn't write it there, but okay, I guess I didn't write it down. But um, this week I'm noted noting like the top one. If we remove the D and we just focus on the, it's an E major, tri E flat major triad, and then the bottom voice would be F sharp minor. So F sharp minor with E flat major. Um, if we add the D back in, which is the first note, that would shake out to an E flat major seven. And then the other one would be <laughs> D seven. Now, I don't know if any of this analysis will be significant, but I'm, I'm just trying to see different, I'm trying to just, trying to just notice the different parts of it so that if other parts of it show up again later, I will be more primed to recognize them. And then also just the intervals in the dyads, I guess. And by dyad, I just mean two notes at the same time, like group of two notes. So this one would be a minor seventh. This would be a major sixth. And then another major sixth. So. Yeah, I think it's a really, it's like maybe one of my favorite little bits of music from this season. It's very small, but it is so, um, it's so evocative. And I feel like not only the notes that were chosen, it, so like the harmony of it, but I feel like kind of the instrumentation and the fact that it's so short, like it's such a, like it's so specific, I think. And a lot of other themes in the show are not very specific, which is why it's easy to confuse them. Like the various clone ones, I'm sorry, but Hauser, sorry, but Mayday and Cro Brother uh, Crosshair's theme and like the noble clone theme, they run together in my mind. A lot of them run together in my mind. This one is very specific though. And so that's one of the reasons I like it. Um, I wonder what Omega will do with the force sensitive kids. Can someone who isn't force sensitive like Omega teach force sensitive kids based on what she learned from Gunji and Ventress? How do you say the Wookiee's name? I am not quite sure. Is it Gunji or Gungi? I can't remember. But that's a good question because what happens now? All the kids in that room are like clearly more overtly, at least they have at least they are personally more aware of their force sensitivity than Omega is. But maybe something like the opposite could happen too. Like maybe they, like what would they potentially teach Omega? I feel like Omega probably will mobilize them though, because that's what she does. In fact, I wonder if Hemlock knows what he's getting into putting Omega there. Like I'm, I'd almost think that he would put her in like isolation because she's an instigator. Unless he underestimates her still, but she already did break out once. Did hear crosshair theme slowly come in when he was talking about Rampart to the Bad Batch. Do you have a timestamp for that so I can go back and review that? Let me see if it's in my notes. It would probably be around... Oh, 
Oh, like toward the beginning of the episode, maybe. Before they meet up with Rampart. Hmm. I'm listening back to myself. Omega will lead a breakout with the younglings and perhaps the other Batcher dogs. I hope the Batcher dogs get freed too. I like how we're getting multiple shows now. 343, okay, thanks, Max. Where there's like prison breakout plots. I mean, and why wouldn't there be? Okay. Yep, you're right. You're right, Max. It's lower, though. Yep, that is indeed... Crosshairs theme. Good catch. 343. Now I'm adding that to my notes. 343. In case it comes up again in my life, which probably won't. Um, I think Hemlock is putting Omega in there because it's heavily guarded. He is underestimating the trouble that she can cause. I think so too. I mean, that makes sense. But still, the underestimation is like... It's like always a downfall of If Hemlock, we have a, Christina, <laughs> hello, Zanthi, I'm s and everyone, I'm sorry to be so late, <laughs> <laughs> okay. we've been having a very chill stream going through lots of stuff, and Justin provided examples too, so, that's wonderful, yes, um, we are currently discussing why Hemlock... I like your shirt. Thank you. I made my light to match the shirt. <laughs> nice. Oh, I see. Very good. Um, we're currently discussing what, why we think, like, Omega being put in with the four sensitive kids at the end. Like, what trouble she could cause. Why they And why Hemlock even put her there, knowing that she's such an instigator. Um, hmm. Yeah. Does Hemlock know that Omega's an instigator? Well, she has already escaped once. With yeah. with Crosshair. Yeah, it occurs to me that maybe Hemlock doesn't know about her social powers. Uh, mm. Like, maybe he thinks that that was like Nalase or something. I don't know. Or that she did force yeah. stuff. Maybe he thinks that she's like a f seasoned force user. Or something. I don't know though. Interesting. Maybe he like knows Emery too well and is like, oh yeah, Omega's like a little Emery, even though they couldn't be more different. Uh, Either way, he's underestimating her. Yes, absolutely. I also wonder if Hemlock will experiment on Omega putting midichlorians in her, unlocking her potential to be force sensitive. Hmm. Didn't they say in the episode that midichlorians can't be transferred or something? I sense that the word used was replicated. Replicated. But I... An individual's M count cannot be directly replicated. Attempts have been made, but each time the level's degraded. Okay. Okay. Oh, and her blood sample yielded, right, her blood sample didn't yield a favorable M count, they said. They said it yielded a favorable, favorable M count replication. So what is the difference? Uh, 
I have a suggestion. Okay. <laughs> it can be, uh, I'm going to take it to the cooking world with an analogy. So maybe it's like when you're trying to mix substances and you try to mix oil and water and they don't mix. And that's what always happens with the midichlorians. And maybe Omega's blood is like more like oil and vinegar or something. And you can make a dressing, like a salad dressing out of it because eventually the molecules will uh, join together. What? <laughs> <laughs> wait okay so the m meaning the m count the midichlorians could be more easily extracted or since they're i would go with the opposite way like maybe the midichlorians can more easily like join the mixture oh so they're not like oil and vinegar oh, sorry they're not like oil and water like yeah, also oil might, maybe we should remove oil from the equation and okay. think of it like, um, let's get a good one. Yes, perhaps. Uh, I'm trying, but. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess I mean like a, the difference between, I like the salad dressing analogy. Like, you know, there's salad dressings where it's like very clearly one substance. And there's salad dressings where it's like, this is a lot of stuff put together in a jar, but yeah. not mixed together, not like truly become, it did not become a new thing. Mm -hmm. It's just stuff. It's combined, not mixed or something. I can't remember from chemistry class. There's like yeah. things that combine and things that mix is probably the wrong word. React, I think. Yeah. Like it, like they, um, is the word a reaction versus a mixture? Emul yeah, uh, there's yes. a word that so I think it sounds like emulsion or something like that. That uh, like means that things like truly mm -hmm. dissolve. Dissolve. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. That that's kind of how I picture it. Matthew says midichlorians can't be transferred by blood, but omega's blood is the one exception they have found, and then. Ender says midichlorians can bind to Omega's blood. Bind. I vaguely assumed that she could pass a high M count from one person to a clone without getting the high M count herself. I assumed that too. Yeah, like, like as her genes didn't express that in her, but she still carries the DNA for it or something. I don't know. Um, it looks like they can't clone like midichlorian. They can't clone the midichlorians. A clone of a Jedi has a low M count. So maybe a blood transfusion from Omega will boost their force power. Right. That's true. If you can't clone the midichlorian, you have to transfer the midichlorian. Yeah. And isn't that... Is that what they were trying to do to grow with Grogu too? Right. Right. Were right, they? Right. Okay. Oh. They are taking midichlorians from the force sensitive kid's blood and have been attempting to transfer it into someone else's blood, but it hasn't worked except for Omega's blood. Uh, hmm. So then why are they keeping the force sensitive kids there still? And whose blood are they trying it on? Are they going straight to Palpy? Or are they doing like a lab rat? The midichlorians would be replicating inside the bodies of the children because as you extract blood from the kids, then they make more blood to replace that like their bodies do. And that blood would have more midichlorians. So they're basically like a well, like an endless supply of midichlorians. Mm -hmm. But I mean, they're keeping them there even though it doesn't work. But I guess they're keeping them there because they're still trying. To see if they can figure out a way to make it work. Well, yeah, maybe, maybe they can be collecting midichlorians little by little. I wonder. They have like a, a tub of midichlorians. I also point out, though, that if, I mean, if they were able to, like, have just midichlorians and inject them in someone, 
then like rich people in the universe would have been having that done to themselves. That's so true. <laughs> That's so true. Yeah, no. It's yeah, like kind of like how the Marvel universe really leans on that with like superpowers. Like, oh, oh I got okay. an injection of a superpower and became. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, you know, that's kind of like a top way to get become a superhero. In Marvel, oh goodness, <laughs> I feel like. Um, but... Take midi one. Take midichlorian rich blood from a force sensitive child. Snoke. I mean, it's possible. It's possible. That would have been Snoke long time in the making. <laughs> yeah. Um, if, if Hemlock gets oh. killed, do you think it will be by Omega, Emery, Crosshair, or the Batcher Dogs? Oh! I like that. I don't think it would be Omega. Now, would no, it be Omega's Nala I like the Batcher Dogs, but honestly, Hemlock? Hemlock is the kind of scary that I'm not even sure they would attack him. Mm. I don't know. Like, some people have that ability to, like, look at a predator and just be like, don't mess with me. Maybe it'll be the, not the, um, not the Batcher Dogs, but the ones that are, that predate on the Batcher Dogs. Like, the ones outside that are even scarier than the Batcher Dogs. Yeah. But I also kind of feel like this season we've already gotten an instance where it was, like, the bad guy gets released to the Wrath Towers and whatever. So it would be, it would feel a little bit repetitious if they did that again, I think. What if it's Tarkin? <laughs> <laughs> Tarkin's like, ha ha, opportunity. <laughs> Add it to my schedule. Okay. That would be funny. What if it's Nala Say? I think Nala Say. Did you see Sabrina, the, the new one? You know, the like show. the one that came out. Yeah, the show. Yeah, I at least saw part Actually, of it. I guess I shouldn't even continue this because it's just the, the way that it ended, I suddenly realized has like a, quite a parallel with Omega's story. And I was like, oh, I could easily see Omega ending up kind of like how Sabrina ended up. Okay. Yeah, I don't remember. And or or maybe And I, I feel like and it occurs to me that since I'm talking about the end, like that's, you know, obvious spoiler. Did you see Wednesday? You did. Yeah. Hmm. Um. Omega is a catalyst, so she is like a sports teams coach, but doesn't play on the team. Catalyst. Mm. That is a key word. I think. Do you think she doesn't play on the team? She helps performance, gives them strategies, but she isn't on the field. I mean, I guess she's often not on the field because mm -hmm. she's being prevented from being okay. on the field. Because to protect her. <laughs> she's a catalyst, though. She will be like, we can do it and we should do it. Okay, got it. <laughs> okay, so we still have point one. Good. Okay, I was like, that's a really short list coming from <laughs> Arc Fonts. <laughs> from one. <laughs> from one. <laughs> <Just Yeah. laughs> Take M Rich blood from child, put it in Palpy Clone. Doesn't work. Or take M Rich blood from child, mix it with Omega's blood. Put it in Palpy Clone. Does work. Oh, right. Oh, right. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So Omega wouldn't be the main source of the midichlorians themselves. It would be that her blood facilitates the replication, the whatever, the transfer. Mm -hmm. Because of the cooking thing you said or something. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, there's there's a connection there. Yeah. I believe it. I have belief. Like a surrogate <laughs> or something. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, okay. The Zillow Beast will eat Hemlock. Ooh, oh. I like that. Omega riding the Zillow Beast would trump Boba riding a Rancor. Yes. But I think mm -hmm. 
many things in life would trump that. <laughs> um, the four sensitive kids also are there for the endless. Or, what was that? The slither vines could get hemlock. That's true. For some reason he could have to go back to that planet. Mm -hmm. be nice. and, oh, and the lost boys or whatever, whatever they're called um, could help unleash the forest on him. The four sensitive kids. A duel between Hemlock and, and Crosshair would be a good duel, though. That'd be. Right. And Crosshair already has a lot of blood on his hands. Like, I feel like it wouldn't be. I feel like they wouldn't give. It wouldn't be Omega. Um, but Hemlock has already. I'm sorry. Crosshair already has a lot of blood on his hands. So they could give it to him. Um, oh, yeah. oh, yeah, the Lost Boys got to come back. Yeah, yeah, I think so, too. Um, anyway, the four sensitive kids are there for an endless source of blood filled with midichlorians because they can't keep going back to Palpatine and taking blood from him. Gotcha. I mean, this all makes sense. This plus Arc um yeah. proposal would make sense. Um, like Also, for sure, they're not only making, like, one Snoke or, like, one clone. They're definitely making, like, oh, no. They're trying a few Diggy's different... He's going to hurt me. Ah! <laughs> oh my gosh um sorry are you okay? <laughs> yes yeah, I'm, I'm wearing long sleeves thankfully okay but she wants to hurt me she okay. wants to play play Never predator <sighs> could be anakin um Okay, at 8.14, where the Bad Batch are sneaking into the checkpoint, the music and percussions sounds like Hans Zimmer. 8.14, let me see. Okay, I'm finding it. I'm listening. Oh, the synthy stuff? I suppose. Yeah, when I think of Hans Zimmer's studio, sometimes I um, one of the things I think of is like them talking about how they use a lot of like I don't know, just like weird metal objects mm -hmm. or something like that to produce sounds. Like let's go a slinky or like let's go a like let's do and and it does have that that uh, that flavor. Mm. Yeah, I think. Yeah, Hans Zimmer. Um. And, uh, oh, sorry, keep going. No, I feel like if this sounds like Hans Zimmer, it's from a lesser known spot from a lesser known movie, perhaps. Because I feel like now he goes out of, now he really tries to go all out with creating a new instrument or like doing something where the sound is very tailored or something like he's a sound designy composer. And so I feel like he would probably have changed those instruments a little bit more to make them a little bit more unique. I think I'm giving him more credit than I usually do. <laughs> I support your analysis. <laughs> Or I, yeah. This this cue brings me to the one of the things that I was excited about about this episode, which is the alien in the the, the creature in the who who is like Admiral Rampart's uh, friend who speaks. Yeah. We I spent a long time trying to figure out how they talk. That was pretty good. You know, it reminds me of yeah, a little bit of the do. scratchlings. Uh, yeah. I picture the scra oh, scratchlings. Yeah. That's a lot. <laughs> 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 oh, 
I obey. <laughs> Um, yeah, what alien is that called? What, what alien was that? It reminded me physically of the alien that's in the Mandalorian who is what is taking care of the child. In, oh, you mean the Ugnaught? Oh, the, oh, the Ugnaught, right. Okay. The yeah. Ugnaught. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. The he looked Ugnaughty, sound- but. Yeah. He, he did look Ugnaughty, but his voice sounded more distant than yeah. I feel like I've. I don't know. The, the voice sounded a little bit different than I'm used to, but um, yeah, of course. Okay. Ugnot. It was kind of like the sand people's talk, but the sand people have more of a, like there's more pitch in the sand people and like higher pitched grunts and things like that. This one was interesting because it was like, you could almost hear like something akin to like, words and basic except just in this like really strange voice it was interesting I don't know yeah I like the transformation of the Ugnaught sounds I guess from the first time we hear them is in Empire Strikes Back I feel like the in Empire Strikes Back I remember the Ugnaughts not sounding not sounding particularly porcine <laughs> like they don't really sound like pigs mm. um but in mandalorian wait there are ugnots right. in mandalorian right and there are man- okay there are ugnots in rebels i think i mean there's ugnots everywhere but i feel like the i feel like we get a little bit of a range a wide range of the sounds that they make and of course it makes a difference whether they're actually given like speaking like quill in the mandalorian or like you know main main character type of speaking like actual lines or if they're just background grunts and stuff um my guess is that hemlock will die being buried under part of mount tantus as the bad batch escape and have a series of explosions going off that's mm. a pretty good guess actually I, I i like that yeah i like that that could happen what else did you like from this episode, Christina? Or what else did you not like from this episode, even? <laughs> Is that had, has that been the feeling? Not um, really. Just let's see. I liked the. There were a few things that I liked, um, and. There was a specific thing that I was going to bring up first. What was it? It was, um, I did enjoy towards the end when, uh, like in the 18th and 19th minutes when we get the confinement theme, Mm -hmm. but it was just like really muddy and ominous because usually Mm -hmm. it has a little bit more of a, a kind of this pure sound to it, but it was very muddy, very ominous. And I, I think we haven't really heard it quite like that. I mean, I'm sure we have, I guess, but um, I hadn't noticed it being so dark. Right, right. And you mean, oh, and I forgot to mention that one. Yeah. um, Yeah, I forgot to mention that, but I'm going to play, actually, I'm going to play again Justin's recreation. And I will say that I, on the Bad Batch season three volume one soundtrack um the track that that theme first appears on is called daily routine so that's another i guess Mm. good characterization of the theme but here's what justin prepared for us
that was so good. Um, it really captured the like the plotting nature. It's just like there, like this. A lot of things in this episode had a very just like we're we're moving, we're moving, we're moving, we're moving, we're continuing, we're taking steps, and uh, yeah, that really came across there. What did you think of the sound mix or like? This is kind of a leading question because I have opinions about it, but if mm-hmm. it didn't stand out to you, that's okay. <laughs> the sound mix. Yeah, I mean, like, I guess this the the relative levels of everything. So I'm like mm. leading you way too much. Yeah, I um, I mean, I guess I didn't have too many thoughts about it, although I vaguely recognized that it wasn't as like nuanced as some episodes have been. Uh, it was, yeah, so that, that's all I'll say about that. Yeah, I feel like, I guess, I guess nuanced would be how I might describe it too. I mean, basically, I think that the music was overpowering the dialogue um, in that spot. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I see what you mean. Um, for sure. Yeah. And... Maybe in a way I like that because it, I, I support things where, where it, uh, where there's like actual competition, making it stressful to be the listener, to be the viewer, to be the audience, mm. um, in a stressful moment. Like I, if I, like, I don't know if that was purposeful or not, but I, I like things where I, I, I think it's, it's cool. It's an interesting thing to deal with when you try to make perceiving the work stressful in the first place uh, sort of another level of manipulation than just we're gonna put ominous music with this to to let the audience know that it's ominous we're actually gonna make them work harder to <laughs> to find so yeah i think that's well to the purposeful making the audience work harder that's pretty funny <laughs> yeah um yeah i've had collaborators before who are who are very interested in like making the audience feel embarrassed or making the audience feel like um, just different kinds of things. And, and that's an interesting question. Is yeah. A, how do you do it? B, is it right to do it? C, you know, it's, it's a, it's just interesting. I mean, um, it, it's definitely like a, a fine line to walk. I mean, I guess there's no clear cut. There's usually no clear cut indication of whether, I don't know, the line that you're walking is justified or not. I mean, it, it all depends on your goals because then I remember, I'm recalling that concert that I reviewed, the one that you went with to me, you went with me to the concert series, but you didn't go to this first one that I think was oh, yes. uncomfortable <laughs> to the detriment of me as an audience member being able to enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't mind being made and uncomfortable, you're- but like for me, that was a step too far and I couldn't it made me completely just check out of the concert and want to leave. Yeah. And to clarify, like uh, some of like the backgrounds of that story is that like you get, you think that maybe they curated it specifically so that you would be uncomfortable. It's not like they didn't know that that would be uncomfortable. It was like, yeah. we're going to put you in a very cold place yeah. in an uncomfortable sit- setting mm-hmm. and make you sit there for a long time doing, you know? Yeah. So that that's interesting. Um, yeah, but like for some people in the audience, I think it may have worked well because they might not be as sensitive as I was to the environment and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So this the line is going to be different with every artist totally. and also every audience member. Um, yeah, yeah. There's movies that I haven't been able to watch because I start watching them and my nervous system itself is too upset about the visual and audio stimulation that happens in the movie. And I'm like, okay, this is unhealthy. Like I can watch it if I'm willing to then go do some physical therapy, but, (laughs) but I can't like watch this without it being like uh, an active detriment to my, my person. Uh, The example of the specific one I'm, one that I'm thinking of is the movie, the lighthouse with, uh, uh, with Robert Pattinson and the wonderful, illustrious person that I love. Uh, what was his name? 
Uh, who's, who's the guy? The Lighthouse. Is it recent? Yes. Um, but William Defoe. William Defoe. William Defoe. I love William. De- William Defoe. He's just like one of my favorite performers. I'm looking at what he's in because obviously I know that I know the name, but I'm like, yeah, he actually is. He takes his characters and his acting tool. I mean, like he's totally absurd and. Uh, he's great in like uh, there's like an Irish gang movie that he's in that's just wonderful. He gangs played, in New York. Like, it's right. No, it's it's got that vibe. Uh, but it's yeah, he's great. Everything he's in. He's an American awful. Psycho. I can see that. He's in Spider Man. Yeah, he plays the Green Goblin. He has a cameo in The Aviator. He does an amazing job portraying He's in Fantastic Mr. Fox. He's in Murder on the Orient Express. He's in a lot of movies. There's an entire separate Wikipedia page for his filmography. He's in a lot of stuff. He's in Justice League. Asteroid City. I want to see that one. Oh, he's in Poor Things. I want to see that too. Okay. Okay. Oh, he's in The Boy and the Heron. He, he's the noble pelican. English dub. He also played Jesus. Christine, I can't tell if you're extremely still or if you froze. I think she <laughs> um, He was in Spider Man and Spider Man No Way Home. Um, okay. That was funny. I would think the choice to have. I would think the choice to have the music overpower Hemlock's dialogue would be to overemphasize. Would be to emphasize Omega's uneasy mood as they head down the corridor. And that's kind of what I think too, Chuck. Like, I don't think it was to necessarily make the audience uncomfortable or something but yeah froze for sure um but I think the music like the music kind of is the a representation of emotions often um and so I think that's the purpose it was serving to almost like her emotions were overpowering sort of just the facts of what was happening Um, Willem Dafoe. Well, I, I don't, he was an Aquaman. So he seems like the kind of person who's had like a very decorated career since 1980 was his first listed film, but then is maybe so, like he has this sort of cred that has made him also be tapped for lots of superhero films in the last 20 years, maybe. Um, yeah. And have like small roles and things too, as cameo cameos, like he's in a few, though he's in a few documentary documentaries as himself. He's the narrator in river. Um, I feel like that would be a cool place to get to in one's career. Oh, he plays Vincent van Gogh in an eternity's gate. Um, he's a fantastic character actor. Yeah. Okay. I believe that. I, I didn't, the Pelican, I thought Robert Pattinson played the Pelican in Boy and the Heron though, but maybe there's two different ones. Oh, there's two. Okay. There's the noble Pelican and no, oh, no, Robert Pattinson was the Heron. That's right. Okay. Anyway. Well, I don't know if Christina's coming back. I don't know her... Put them in things when you want the very specific flavor that is Willem Dafoe. That makes sense. Oh, here she is. I thought I was talking. I thought you were being very, very still until I realized you were frozen. 
Indeed. I am adjusting my settings. <laughs> okay. Um, Chuck said, That's I think better. the music, the choice to have the music overpower Hemlock's dialogue would be to over, would be to emphasize Omega's uneasy mood as they head down the corridor. And I would agree with that. Are you in a different spot of your room? No, my internet clearly died and my computer does not have access to the internet anymore. So I used my phone disconnected from Wi-Fi. Oh my gosh. And I hope your internet comes back. And my phone has a vastly different view. Hmm. Interesting. Well, does anyone else have any final thoughts or about the Bad Batch season three, episode twelve? Or Christina, do you have other notes? Um you already the one mm -hmm. that you said is different from all the ones I said, so Yeah, I um I liked the uh, at from the ninth the ninth and tenth minutes, which I called the battle prep music. Mm -hmm. I liked that exposed drum set line mm -hmm. and the um, the deliberate driving step motion in the pitched instruments. Oh, do you mean like the kind of octatonic ascension? I don't know. I think I do. Yes. Okay. Let me think. Let me find a timestamp. Yeah, I'm trying out. Oh, right, I can't. I like the episode, and did you see my comment about the mix? Oh, no, I didn't. Let me go up to find that. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, Max says, I liked the mix, the sound mix. It sounded like music from an 80s horror movie. Oh, interesting. Do you have an example? <laughs> Christina's frozen again. Um, the part where you said, like, I think the section you're talking about is probably what I said was the most boring music to me. So I think that's interesting. But like, it was kind of action ostinato. like repetitive action stuff. Yeah. My notes say run of the mill tense music. Yeah. Ooh, there was also a moment that I really liked the 14th minute when during the battle, the Versus whatever use missiles mm -hmm. and the bad batch intercept the missiles with laser fire and that visual effects and sound design was extremely clear and crisp and well done i was really oh. pleased with it oh that's neat okay like i felt like i could see every missile and hear every missile and like see One's intercepted, one's landed in Meru. And, um, yeah. Well, credit to the sound team there. Like, I think there's probably a lot of, I mean, obviously there's a lot of there's hard work that goes Fire on. sounds. Fire sounds? Fire work sounds. Like, I feel like a lot of the audio effects, I was like, that just sounds like a firework. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's funny. I guess I've never heard a real explosion. Yeah. I think I have, Thanks but in a simulated, but like, like at a, like at Universal Studios or something. So uh, technically it counts, I think, but still. Yeah. Um, did you notice Rampart's theme throughout this? I forgot even what the deal was. I forgot uh, what? No. I forgot, like, what is Rampart's deal? Like, right. Who he is and why he matters. Although I remember his name strongly, like, Prattles, but 
Yeah. I kind of had forgotten who Rampart was too because I got him mixed up with Hauser for a second. But then upon hearing his music, his music told me that he was probably a bad guy. So it kind of took me back to like season one. For sure. Yeah. Um, Max says, I mean the mix where Omega put was put in the vault with those children. Yeah, I liked there too. I mean, we had the sort of midichlorian kid motif again. Um, the like chimey thing. Chuck, Borny, that's what I that's what I was trying to draw from, mm-hmm. I think. Is what I've yeah, it's like very born movie ish. Um whom John Powell, who did solo a Star Wars story, did the born identity. And yeah, you're right. I hear a lot of that too, for, too, for sure. Okay. Any other notes from this episode? Yeah, I don't know much else this episode. It was... Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us for episode 312 of The Bad Batch. We only have three, three episodes left. 13, 14, 15. Yep. Only one more episode, one episode per week for the rest of the series. And it will be the final season. According to the soundtrack, it says the final season, the Bad Batch, the final season. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I'm hoping for something exciting next week. Now that, now that we're getting to Tantus, now that we're in Tantus, um, hoping for more Omega with the four sensitive kids. That's like what I'm really interested in. Thanks for joining, Matt. Siggy. Oh, are you going to attack Christina on camera? <laughs> what is she doing? <laughs> She's anyway, being peaceful. She is being peaceful, uncharacteristically. I suppose. Um, I look forward to Omega causing trouble with the four sensitive kids. Me too. That is what I look forward to in life. Um, yep. Oh, Siggy. All right. Bye, everyone. I'm going to play Justin's music on the way out. (laughs) I keep putting it on mute. (laughs)